month as planned season seven. Today's is going to be focused on live surgery. And I have the pleasure to have a, a friend of mine and a colleague of mine, a well-known, world-renowned surgeon, skull-based surgeon. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Narayanan Janakiram from Royal Peer Hospital, India. Hello. Good evening to all of you. Good morning to some people who are uh, there in America and uh, good afternoon to the people in Italy. Uh, really congratulate so, Dr. Puya. Yeah, carry on Dr. Puya. So for those who don't know, you might go and watch our back, our YouTube channel with all these uh, instructional courses and live surgery we already performed by John Akiram. And, and uh, you will see today something a little different, which is going to be focused on the revision cases, but mainly on nasal polyposis. The setup to, for today is going to be an uh, introduction from a colleagues of uh, Dr. Janaki Ram, and then he are going to perform the surgery with his team. So if for anyone would like to ask some question, I will remind you to type your question from every platform and we will reply, we will try to ask those questions directly during surgery and even at the end of it. So, Janaki, please, I'll, I'll leave the torch to you. Go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. So, before uh, Dr. Monica is going to start the, uh, the briefing about the case, I just want to uh, give a brief introduction about uh, my, myself and also about my brother, Dr. Puya. So all of you, Doctor, uh, you know Dr. Puya, uh, a very, very dynamic academician, a world-renowned, uh, you know, rhinologist. And uh, the first time I met him was in Verize, where, uh, you know, we went to Endo Milano Masterclass. And uh, really, I have a lot of brothers there, like Paolo Batalia and, uh, you know, many people. And, of course, our teacher, Dr. Paolo Castelnuovo, Pro Professor Castelnuovo. Really uh, congratulate Dr. Puya for uh, this wonderful endeavor of NASA Sano. I really appreciate and I think we have done a lot of life surgeries, uh, more of skull base. Today I said we'll do rhinology and I just want to introduce that we are the directors of Royal Pearl Group of Hospitals. Uh, we have now started uh, six centers, uh, six hospitals uh, centers in uh, Hyderabad and we also have our mother center in Trichy. And um, yeah, we do uh, skull base, rhinology, and all sorts of ENT work uh, in all these centers in India. So you're all, all most welcome for fellowship programs. Uh, I offer now, we have 21 fellows working here around the clock. So um, we will go directly without much ado onto the case presentation. And I think uh, we'll have to share the screen, right? Uh, Monica is there and she's from Hyderabad. Yes, Monica. To share the screen, just share screen. Perfect. Yeah, carry on. Please. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see the screen, please, Dr. Puya? Yes, everything is fine. I'm Dr. Maunika, resident of Royal Pearl Hospital, Trichy. I'm going to brief about the case uh, Janikiram sir is going to do now. A uh, male patient aged 49 years, resident of Thiruvarur, presented to ENT outpatient department with chief complaints of nasal obstruction since two years, uh, which is more on right side compared to left side. History of smell disturbances present, history of rhinorrhea present, history of nasal twang present. Uh, also complaints of frequent sneezing episodes and headache on and off. Uh, no history of facial heaviness on bending forward and no history of post-nasal discharge. No history of visual disturbances. Uh, no previous history of COVID infection. History of two doses of COVID vaccination administered. And surgical history, history of nasal surgery done 15 years back at other hospital. No comorbidities. Coming to the examination part, uh, in the nose, uh, septum is midline and pale glistening polypoidal tissue seen occupying both nasal cavities. On probe test, it is insensitive to touch. Probe can be passed all around except superiorly, not bleeding on probing. Uh, Cole spatula test was done with decreased misting on right side compared to the left side. Here, bilateral uh, tympanic membrane was intact and throat no abnormality detected. 
this is the uh, CT paranasal sinuses of the patient. Uh, I'm handing over mic to Jankiram sir for further discussion of the CT scan. Uh, how do I show the CT? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So one good thing about our theater is that uh, we have teleconferencing facilities and we can, uh, you know, project our surgery on daily basis. We can, we can, you know, connect with any university across the globe and uh, we can teach residents that way. In fact, every day we are doing live. Every day we are doing live to some university. And of course, it's a privilege to do it with uh, uh, Dr. Fuya, who is my brother. Now, I'm going to start reading the CD scans. This is a case of a revision polyposis. See, basically, there are some uh, caveats and also rules um, in operating on revision cases. Number one is that we do not know what the previous surgeon has done. The notes is not there. And we have to see whether there's any breach on the dural plate or there's a breach on the lamina paparasia, whether there are residual cells, and uh, is there an OMOD cell, a dehiscent optic nerve, and also any dehiscent carotid. These are the things we have to look for. And more importantly, the frontal recess. I always concentrate on the frontal recess and uh, that uh, whether there is new osteogenesis because uh, during repeated surgery, what happens and repeated infection, there's a lot of new osteogenesis. And so if there is a, a lot of new osteogenesis, then we'll have to do a, a more radical procedure like a draft three. So like a you know, modified Lothra procedure or so. But in this case, uh, fortunately, the previous surgeon has not bungled too much with the frontal recess. Maybe uh, since it was done a long time back, then the endoscopes were not very advanced. The camera systems were not very advanced, so they just left the frontal recess. So, where has the started uh, recurring? Maybe, maybe because you leave behind cells uh, uh, around the uh, skull base. That is the commonest area where we leave behind cells and also the post-operative follow-up. Surgery is not the end point for nasal polyposis. Let us understand that it is not a pure surgical, uh, you know, one-time treatment. It is a lifelong surgical worse plus a medical treatment. So the surgery just aids, aids us for the steroid solution to reach the sinuses. And once we douche the sinus regularly with the steroids, sprays, and as well as the douching solutions, that will give a better, uh, the best relief. So with that in mind, I'm going to now go on to read the scans now. So, Dr. Monica is now showing you the uh, scans. Okay. Okay. So, that's the Gantry view. You can see here the uh, frontal recess, frontal sinus impact. That's the frontal sinus, perpendicular plate of ethmoid. And you can see that there's a big cell which is left behind here. And you can see that this is uh, also the frontal recess, and you can see that cell completely not touched at all. The frontal recess seems to be a little uh, wide, but filled with cells. You can see that this is a medial drainage of the frontal sinus on the uh, the right side. The left side also, see the, the uncinate is forking here towards the medial length and the lateral aspect. So maybe it's a posteromedial in this side. And uh, this side, you can see that the uncinate is still remaining. See, the main problem, they have removed all those uh, cells here, but towards the frontal, they have not removed anything. That looks to me like a lateralized middle turbinate. That's the middle turbinate, which is lateralized here. This is what I feel. And uh, you can see that this is the, uh, you know, the cells in the anterior ethmoids. That's the maxilla. And here, you can see here, that's the anterior ethmoid lottery. You can see that that's the anterior model artery. And you can see there's a very, very small suprovital limitization. And here also, but I don't think it's dehiscent. It's, it's running along the skull base. The skull base is type one Kiros type, type one skull base. And then as we go behind, you can see a little cells in the, uh, uh, just along the basal lamella. And here also you can see cells in the posterior ethmoids. 
You can see a lot of cells in the posterior ethmoids which have not been removed. You can see a Haller cell here. You can see that's a Haller cell. You can see that's a beautiful Haller cell which has not been removed. And you can see here again a Haller cell on the left side as well. And uh, we can see that uh, that's the maybe the superior turbinate has uh, not been touched. So um, you can see that uh, this is the sphenoid sinus. Uh, I don't, yeah, this looks to me maybe like an onodi cell. Uh, let's see, yeah, this looks like an onodi cell for sure. And you can see that's a, we call that a Harzala cell. This is actually uh, named after Harzala. He has published a paper. A cell between the maxilla and the, uh, and the sphenoid sinus. Maybe a posterior most Harzala cell. He has named like that. So that's a Harzala cell. That's a coena. And you can see that the sphenoid sinus is a little disease, not much. So basically, the disease extends right from uh, the, the vestibule here and then goes towards the frontal. We have to do a frontal sinusotomy. We have to do a, a complete ethmoidectomy. We have to do a maxillary sinusotomy on both sides. And uh, we'll have to do a posterior ethmoidectomy and a sphenoidotomy on both sides. So this requires a full house pest. And that's what we're going to do for this case. And uh, the time given to me is around one hour. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you, Janaki, for the introduction and for the, the presentation of the cases. So, what we do is uh, we give a head elevation and uh, we actually, you can see the polyp here, very clearly seen. And uh, Dr. Puya, are you getting the picture, please? Yes. Yeah. Is it clear? Is it clear, please? It's, it's perfect. Okay, right. So this is the picture here. And this is a common case. That's why we selected every time we're showing the pituitary and the cardomas and things like that. So at least let us show some basic case. So that's why I selected this case. Hope you agree with me, Dr. Priya. Let's make it interactive. Yes, sure. Um, so uh, you would you please tell... Would you please tell our uh, followers before the, the surgery, if you are packing the nose and with which solution? Yeah, that's a very, very good uh, point. Uh, yeah. The, the pre-operative, so we have kind of, you know, two types of packing. The first packing is done in the pre-op room uh, with one in 5,000 adrenaline. One in 5,000 adrenaline, that's taken for biopsy. Uh, and I keep it for 45 minutes before the surgery. That is done with a headlight. And the second packing is done on the intraoperative uh, table once the patient gets anesthetized. And that is with one in 1,000 adrenaline. So that is with one in 1,000 adrenaline. So that's how we pack. And it's unquantified, undiluted adrenaline. And here you can see that Dr. Satya is holding a a uh, syringe with a warm saline at 40 degrees, and we will be continuously irrigating this with warm saline. So in revision polyp surgery, the challenge lies in finding out landmarks. So what are the landmarks do we have right now? We have the septum, we have the inferior turbinate. Of course, we don't see the middle turbinate anywhere in the picture. So we have to create landmarks now. The first landmark I want to define is the inferior turbinate. So what you do is keep your debrider towards the inferior turbinate. See here. This is how I keep it. And then move the debrider up and down like this. See here. This is how you move it. So the first step in polyp surgery, I always say, is humanize the airway. You have to. You can see that a doctor is going on irrigating with warm saline. That way, what happens is that I don't have to remove my scope at all. I don't have to remove my scope for fogging, anti-fogging at all. So I don't have to anti-fog the scope. So this is like, for example, a 300 surgery. This is very useful because it also, uh, the, the warm saline helps by causing hemostasis by activating the extrinsic pathway. See that now? We have luminized the airway. So this is the first step in any polyp surgery we do. So this is step one of polyp surgery. The step two of polyp surgery is 
finding the anatomical landmark. See here what I do. Now, now the direction of the debrider was like this. Now up and down. Now what I'm going to do is slightly tilt it towards the its outer cancer of the other, other eye and see here what I do now. Then we start eating the polyp and we'll have to find out where the middle terminate is. So the main idea is to find out the position of the middle turbinate according to the scan was seen lateral. I see that's a, that's a polyp attached to the septum actually. Now you can see here, I'm going towards the middle meatus. That's the middle meatus. I'm taking off the middle meatus polyp. You can see how beautifully we are able to find out the landmark. I'm going to define the landmark very shortly. So that could be the attachment of the middle turbinate. Yeah, that is the middle turbinate. Then this is polyp. So you see here, we can actually find out the middle turbinate either in its in its anterior attachment or in its posterior attachment. So here I found it out from its posterior attachment. Now that's the answer it causes. I'm trying to now take off all these polyps. I'm going towards the olfactory cleft. That's towards the septum. That's the olfactory cleft. You can see how nicely we are able to remove all those polyps attached to the septum. This patient also presents with an ostomy. So be very gentle when you move your debrider. You see, I'm slowly rotating the debrider. The most important thing is to see the movement of the debrider. Many people they try to move it randomly. No. They are, there are specific movements of the debrider which you have to follow and that gives you a very, very beautiful view of what you are doing. That, that's very important. I'm using a zero degree telescope and I'm just trying to find out the position of the middle turbinate. So that is my key point to find out where the middle turbinate is, where the uh, where the unsnet processes. So that's exactly now you see my deployer is turned towards completely towards the lamina papracia. Can you appreciate it, please? Yes. So that looks like the middle turbinate remnant. So I think we have chopped off a little bit of the middle turbinate. That I'm sure about that because. Yeah. Now, having done that, what I do now is I keep I keep a fact one in one thousand. I didn't fact. Now you can see here now. That is the quena. So I've removed the quenal banking effect. So this looks to me like the remnant middle turbinate. This looks to me like the unsinate process. That is the severe portion of the middle turbinate. That is the septum to which the polyps were attached. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to place this one in 1,000 Arduin pack. One more. See here, I'm just going to pack it and I'm going to just wait for a minute. So when you pack it with one in 1,000, many people are scared to use the solution. In fact, throughout the world, I've seen, oh, one in 1,000, why? Why didn't you dilute it? Believe me, Professor Stamberger keeps telling, adrenaline prevents adrenaline absorption. So, you can pack with one in 1,000 adrenaline. Nicely squeezed, but don't inject. So, you see, that we never injected. So, that is one point I never, never like. I never inject. Why don't I inject? When you inject xylocaine with adrenaline, what happens is that the nose is a very vascular structure. You know that the nose is a very vascular structure. And that is erratic absorption of adrenaline as well as of uh, you know, xylocaine. Now, the, the, the anesthetist is trying to give hypotensive anesthesia with he wants to reduce the pulse rate. Whereas you, by infiltrating adrenaline, 
you are increasing the pulse rate, which is not good at all. That is the reason why we never infiltrate. You can see now that is the residual middle turbinate, very clearly seen there. That is the middle mirror lantrostomy, which has been done already. Now, give me a rat 12 or a rat 40 to glide up late. What I'm going to do now, elevator, see what I'm going to do. So, I'm going to elevate. I'm going to lateralize this interior turbinate a little. So once I do that, what will I see? I'll see that. that see that previous surgery. They have done a previous surgery. So I got a landmark. Now I have the inferior turbinate. I have the septum. I have the posterior end. That's the horizontal part of the middle turbinate. Remnant middle turbinate. That is most probably the remnant middle turbinate. This looks to me like the unsolent process. That is the maxilla. So I've got beautiful landmarks now. I'm going to use a rad uh, 30 degree telescope, please. Now, you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to widen this maxillary ostium. Give me a 30 degree telescope, please, or a 45, whatever. Okay. okay, now you see what I'm trying to do now is I'm going to use my 30 degree telescope. Okay, lovely. I'm going to use my 30 degree and I'm going to see the maxillary sinus. Thank you. I'm being assisted by Dr. Shiva and Dr. Satya. Dr. Janaki, I have a, we have some question from the audience. Uh, well, our colleagues are asking, our colleagues are asking, what is the solution colored in red where you're dipping the tip of the endoscope? That's a uh, That's a solution called Savlon. It's an anti fog solution. And in fact, uh, Carl Stoss also gives uh, anti fog solution. I'm not at all happy with that. This solution is, I, in fact, when I operate abroad, I carry the solution with me. This is a wonderful solution, not react, no reaction in the nose, and causes wonderful anti -forming. Now, see here. Now, I have delineated the middle mural antrostomy. You can see that. Irrigate. See, I didn't take it out at all. See, Satya helped me by just putting in a little <coughs> warm saline. That's it. Okay. Having done that now, So what's the next step? What's the next step? I have to inspect the maxillary sinus to see if the anterior part of the maxillary sinus has polyps or not. Try to widen it a little bit and just see. Give me a uh, 70 degree telescope. I'm going to examine with the 70 degree telescope whether we have polyposes in the anterolateral wall attached. We have type 3 polyposes according to the uh, PJ or more for the PJ or more classification. You see here, I'm just going inside and I'm going to have a look inside. Uh, no, I can't find any polyp. It's very fine. I think this is uh, more than sufficient for me. Can you see the improbable nerve there? The, 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 the impression for the improbable nerve, all of you? Yes. Yes. But by the way, is not there. But by Us. Yes, everyone is clear and, and you can step forward. Thank you. Now I'm just going to take that always don't retain a raw bone. So I'm just going to take off that bone a little bit because that can produce a little osteitis. So always be very, 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 very fussy about <coughs> leaving behind exposed bone. Don't leave behind exposed bone. Okay, having done that, now I'm going to use my zero degree telescope. So the first step is to define the middle mural antrostomy. So this is something like a type 2 to type 3 middle mural antrostomy. Now I'm just going to the next step. That is definition of the lamina papyracea. Yeah, give me a pack. So that's a lamina papyracea. 
So I we have the navigation here, but generally we don't use navigation. This is something we uh, we do it as a routine. So navigation is hardly used by me, even though we we have the stores and the stripe and navigation. Okay, I'm just going to pack this area. I'm going to start operating and delineating the. So we can do two different techniques in this case. One is we can do a Wigan's technique. That is go back. You can see the uh, sphenoid sinus. You can come in front, give me the right. Or we can go from anterior to posterior. I'll do the second technique in the next case. Okay, right. I'll do the second uh, technique, that's the Wigan's technique in the, uh, in the next side. This side, see that's a sphenoid sinus already. So I'm just going to delineate the lamina papyracia. One thing you have to always remember is that wherever you operate, you retain a thin film of mucosa. This is very, very, very important, my dear friends. Don't denude the mucosa. Mucosal preservation is very, very, very essential. So that's the lamina papyracia being delineated by me now. So you saw that in the posterior small region, there was definitely some cells. Now I'm just going to take off that cell, which is called the Harzala cell here. See that exactly corresponding to my CD scan. So that's a beautiful Harzala cell. Uh, give me a population. If you have a little bleeding, don't worry, you have the population with you. So I can populate that vessel there. Um, one question from the audience uh, our colleagues is asking Are you using, are you using uh, ablation uh, mode on or coagulation? I'm using the uh, ablation mode. Now it's the quack mode. So both we, we use it depending upon. Yeah, I stop now. So uh, now you see here that's the Hazala cell. I'm just going to take it out. The wall of that cell is quite thick. You can see that. I'm going to use the uh, forward mode for that. Uh, change to forward mode. So you have what is called the continuous mode of the debrider. I'm going to use the continuous mode of the debrider. Ready? So our colleagues are asking, what's this uh, uh, mode that you introduce and the type of uh, debridement is like drilling mode? Yeah, the, the debrider has got two modes. One is the alternate mode and second is the forward mode. Forward mode acts like a drill. So it's, uh, but the drill, what happens is when you use the real drill, the mucosa is uh, debrided away. That the mucosa, the mucosal damage is there. But when we use the forward mode of this debrider, the mucosa is not damaged. That's the advantage. So whenever we are having a cell with a thick wall, better to go in for a forward mode, which is a drill, but it can save the mucosa. So that's the difference between a real drill and a micro debrider drill. Mode. Which which equipment are you using? Which what? <coughs> which what? Which one? Is the no, no. Is it the make or the debrider? What are you asking? The they are asking what's the company brand that you are using for the as an instrument? 
Metronic, perfect. This is the Metronic and also the, uh, all the instruments are from Carl Stone. So you can see here, that, that's the cell wall. Can you all appreciate it? We read the uh, scan and we knew that the posterior ethmoid was filled with cells. So now we we'll have to remove all these cells. If we should not have recurrence, then it is mandatory that we have a very, 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 very smooth cavity. Another question from the audience is uh, how would you discriminate how would you discriminate superior turbinate and uh, as a landmark for the sphenoid sinus. Oh, the, see that, I already uh, got the sphenoid sinus. See that? The, already the sphenoid sinus, that's the superior term that you can see here. If you go medial, and it's, uh, see that, that's the lower third of the superior term. If you just go medial to it and go inferior to it, you will have the sphenoid off. Of course, in this case, it was already opened by our previous uh, <coughs> surgeon. Of course, don't disturb the superior turbinate in any case because you have olfactory fibers on the superior turbinate. So Another question from the audience. The question from the audience is uh, which degree you're using your endoscope? Forward mode, yeah. What degree? What is the question, please? The question is Are you using a, a zero degree or a 30 degree telescope? Zero, always zero. Now you can see that I'm just using the forward mode. Whenever I want to make the, uh, you know, the cavity very smooth, I always do. Debrider mode, alternate mode. See, whenever I change between the alternate mode and the forward mode, that's very important. A block, a better block. So you should, uh, you should try to change between the alternating mode and the forward mode. Because if you do that, what happens is that you can take off the, uh, you know, the thick sepe with the forward mode. And you can see that the mucosa is draped all over. You can see that we have not stripped the mucosa at all. Everything is draped with mucosa. That's the key to the surgery. If you want to strip the mucosa, <laughs> that is not a good surgery at all. Now that's beautiful. That's the sphenoid sinus. You see that? Basically, when you're doing revision surgeries, you try to mass supply the sinus. You try to mass supply the sinus means open it as big as possible. Don't make small openings. That's very, very, uh, it will sinus again. Now that's the posterior ethmoid skull base. That's the skull base. That's the planum here. That's the planum. You can see that. That's the maxillary sinus, that's the Hazala cell, and that's the maxillary sinus. Beautifully seen. Now I have done the posterior ethmoid dissection. I've done the sphenoid dissection. And uh, that's the superior turbinate in your picture. Okay. Now what remains is the anterior ethmoid and the frontal recess. Now in this case, it's a very, very tricky frontal. The reason is because, what is the reason? Because the middle turbinate is completely, you know, see that, see that V-shape, you know, having that V-shape here. It's going to be very difficult for us to maintain the pendency of the sphenoid sinus. So what do you do? In such a case, what do you do? I prefer in such a case to do an axillary flap. So I would do an axillary flap, which I'm going to demonstrate now. So the axillary flap was first demonstrated by Professor P.J. Ormond. In fact, I've got trained by him also in Adelaide. Wonderful surgeon he is. And uh, 
My basic teacher was Professor Sedi from Singapore. I learned my basics from Professor Sedi. And here we are. That is the sphenoid sinus. See how beautiful, straight view, a zero degree view of the sphenoid sinus. That's the posterior sphenoid skull base. And now that's your fabric left here, very beautifully seen. Give me a good wash, please. Give me a good wash. That is the uh, septum. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the front of the cell. Oh, good, good, good. Enough, enough. That's warm saline. You can see that the bleeding is completely stopped. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Now I'm just going to that the uh, cell which we opened. It was not open before. All covered with mucosa. Very nice mucosa. And now we will go for the front recess and the anterior small dissection. Give me a knife. So I'm going to start with the axillary flap. You see how we do that? Give the punch ready. Now that's the axilla of the middle meatus. I go around eight millimeters above the axilla. And then I create a flap. So that's eight millimeters above, eight millimeters in front, and then you create a flap like this. So I would like to preserve the small middle turbinate because you never know that you will be the last surgeon. So that's a beautiful landmark. Don't touch the middle turbinate at all. If you are a good surgeon, you would never do that. See what I'm trying to do now is to take that flap out. And then try to put it posteriorly now between the middle turbinate and the septum. Okay, having done that now, see I opened up that area. So how does it help? I will show you how it helps very shortly. Now give me a fact, a small fact. Now you see what I'm going to do now. Be very careful. Give me a punch now. Give me a punch. No, after the punch. Just a forty-five degree punch or ninety degree punch. Okay, see that it's opened up a new space there. You can see the lamina coming here. Ah, oh, give me a punch. Now I'm going to use my punch and I'm going to open up the ascending process of the maxilla. So we saw that there was a remnant unsinate process, of course, in the scan, we read it very clearly. The Togenaki, our colleagues, is asking if you would expose part of the lacrimal sac by doing this maneuver. Yeah, we may, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not going to induce the lacrimal sac in any way, but I may expose, but that's not a, a problem. But the thing is, you are not supposed to open it up. That's more important. So this this could be the medial wall of the orbit. It's okay. But the thing is, I need an access to the frontal recess, right? If I want to have an access to the frontal recess, which is extremely narrow here, you can see that very narrow frontal recess here. How do I expose it? So the only way to expose it is to get an access along the lateral wall. So that's the lateral aspect here. Now give me the rat 60 debrider blade. Now I have a beautiful access. I'm very happy about it. By uh, exposing the la la uh, lacrimal sac, you're not going to cause any harm. That is one thing you have to remember. Only by transecting it or doing like that, it's going to harm it. So other than that, this is not going to cause any harm at all. Only thing is don't go and meddle with it. Now, what I will do now is to just hug the nasal frontal beak. See, that's the nasal frontal beak. I know that's a uh, lacrimal sac. That's the lamina paparasia. I exactly know that it's a medial branch from the forward sinus. I'm 
visualizing it this is a zero degree telescope my dear friends i'm not using anything that's the advantage of an axillary flap the axillary flap helps you in converting a 70 degree view into a zero view okay now i'm almost there i just have to uh, use a ball probe now so i'm almost there i just have to use the ball probe and i have to see if that's the frontal if that's the frontal then what i will do that's that's a medial range in the frontal and yes i'm inside the frontal now that is the part which i saw in the scan so everything is going like a 3d in my head so what is happening here is like a 3d it's going in my head and that is actually the uh, uh give me a small lint please okay now give me a 70 degree telescope so yeah give me a small so what i'm going to do now see here this technique i think we have published uh, one of my fellows from russia very atraumatic technique and now you can see that it's gone right inside <clears throat> the front recess that's it so once you do that you're very very super confident that you opened up the front there is no supraorbital cell so that the only place it can go is the frontal sides okay here we are i'm <coughs> just trying to break up all that cells so that i'm going to get a very very wide front recess so i will show you the final result of the front recess detection no give me a 70 degree and a large 60 degree yeah so you saw the gauss piece technique detection and that we practice in the posterior ectomoid sometimes also also the front front when it's very narrow then there's a beautiful technique now you see that's a that's a 70 degree view of the front to now you can see here i'm just going inside i'm going to take that gauss piece out the moment i take it you can see the front can you all appreciate it please i'm going to give a wash give me a wash so how are we very sure that it's the front number one is you can use the navigation that's there the second is wait. you can see the transillumination Oh, give me a last. Give me a last. Now I'm just going to widen that front. So ideally speaking, how wide should be the front? Anything less than six millimeters is going to steal us for sure. It's not working. Man. The bed is not working. The bed is not working. So the boundaries of the front. Let me tell you the boundaries of the front of the recess. Anteriorly, you should have the nasal uh, nasal frontal beak. Anteriorly, you'll be the nasal frontal beak. Posteriorly, we'll have to demonstrate the anterior small artery. Posteriorly, we'll have to demonstrate the anterior small artery, which I think will be here. And you're going to see that very shortly how we're going to demonstrate every bit of anatomy. Medially should be the middle tuberate, and largely should be the lamina papyracea. So here we are. I'm going to make the picture big so that you will have a very nice idea of what is happening here. Now you can see that's the frontal. Can you all appreciate the frontal recess here? Frontal, please. Yes. Yes. My yes. friend, give me a good wash. Now, see, that is not at all enough. You should understand that this will stenose again. How do we make it wide? This is very important. Always give washes. The first step is to give a lot of washes. 
and second is you have to see that you see behind the frontal you have a region like the fovea see that that's the front can you all appreciate the frontal plates all of you yes you see a lot of hyperplasia a little of um, polypoidal mucosa in the frontal is there i'm just going to flush it flush it flush it so keep flushing it you never know you might have a little infiltrated pus or fungus or whatever in the frontal now you can see that that in the frontal you have a little polyp coming out in the other wash keep washing keep washing be patient in the frontal keep washing see that now this is just a little long for my at 40 degrees give me a giraffe one of the of our colleague one of our colleagues is asking a, a question which is uh, can you do caroline window technique here sir can i do what i can't understand uh, uh, caroline's window what is your question please mm -hmm. Our colleague is, is asking if you can do a Caroline's window in in this patient. So I think that he's uh, he's referring to a Richard Harvey technique. I know, I know, I've seen it, but there is no place for the Caroline's window here at all. Uh, uh, and I don't think it's practical in this case, and I don't know the long term results of the Caroline's window also. So that looks like the fovea, and if that's the fovea, that's the anterior small artery. Can you all appreciate the anterior small artery here, please? I'll show you the anterior small artery. Yes. Also. Can you see the anterior small artery, all of you? Yes. Very beautifully seen. Now, what is your aim in front of these surgery? Front of these surgery, your aim should be. You should start from the nasal frontal peak, that is anterior limit. Posterior limit, you should see the anterior small artery. Give me a check it. That should be your aim, <coughs> your goal, to see the anterior small artery. See now, what I'm trying to do is to back a little bit. I preserve that. Um, So that's a, that's the nasal frontal peak. I can see that very clearly. This is the nasal frontal peak here. That's the nasal frontal peak. Very very clearly seen. That's the nasal frontal peak. And now I'm just going to push this gauze piece and show you the frontal. It extends. So the the medial limit is the middle terminate here. The lateral limit is the lamina papyracea. See now. Can you all appreciate it? See that's the fovea here. And the little see the anterior small lateral is here. Can you all appreciate it? Yes. Uh, would you please? Uh, Till here, you should not have any cell. That is the idea of uh, giving a jacket or giraffe. Giraffe. Would you please remind? Would you please remind to our colleagues uh, the direction of the right and the left anterior ethmoidal artery when it comes from the lamina papyracea to the nasal septum? Oh, very, very good, very good question. Very good question. Give me a good watch. See when I, when you see the anterior small artery. First of all, you should understand that the anterior small artery is not exactly in the coronal plane. You should understand that very clearly. Many people think it is right in the coronal plane. No, it is in an oblique plane. It runs from anterior. Uh, sorry, from posterior to anterior. See here, from posterior to anterior. Lateral to medial. You see that it's not exactly in the coronal plane. This is the coronal plane, but here it goes like this. Can you see that, all of you? Yes. Beautifully seen anterior small artery, all of you. So, <coughs> yeah. Do you appreciate it, please? Yes. So, if we go in from uh, uh, anterior to posterior, we can posterior appreciate posterior to anterior. 
lateral to medial in an oblique fashion. In an oblique fashion, just a little deggy center. You can see it's deggy center. Yes. Yes. Well, can you show? Can you show, please, and recap the anti the the phobia? What? Can you say what? The phobia. This is the phobia here. Anterior perfect, and perfect. You can see very beautifully. See the phobia yes. is by the anterior small artery into an anterior quadrant here and a posterior quadrant here. And the posterior quadrant extends to the level of the posterior small artery of the plenum synodale. That's the plenum synodale. You can see the plenum synodale here. That is the plenum. That is the posterior phobia. That's the anterior small artery. That's the anterior phobia. That's the frontal recess. That then is the frontal peak. That's the middle turbinate. That's the lamina papracia. See how beautifully we have delineated everything there. Can you appreciate it? It was perfect. We went through a 70 degree telescope with all the sinuses and the landmarks. Beautiful. Now, the thing is, Dr. Puya, the most important thing is not per operative, per operative opening of the sinuses. That is not your goal. The goal is to maintain this opening throughout your life. Or else, what happens is that you will have the middle turbinate which lateralizes and that is going to go and uh, you know obstruct the front region. So that's why what I did was I am now going to put a flap there. That's a, going to be a flap. You see how I'm going to put that flap? Give me a black screen. Now you see what I do? This is the level of the superior turbinate. This is the level of the middle turbinate. <coughs> okay, this is not very unstable. Okay. Now you see here, give me a uh, elevator now. See, that is the uh, uh, frontal sinus. You can see all the sinuses. Can you see the sinus? Here, maxilla, uh, sphenoid sinus, all the zero degree, zero degree telescope. <coughs> see the anterior small artery with the zero degree telescope. See how beautiful and smooth it looks. Now you see what I'm trying to do is I'm going to push this flap which I harvested like this. Can you get the point please? Yes. As you mentioned, the problem was to make more stable the middle turbinate. And what you did was actually cover the middle turbinate or the remnant of the middle turbinate with the flap that you raised to have uh, the access to the front toe. Correct, 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 exactly. See, what I did now was I have covered that middle turbinate with mucosa. Can you see that? Mucosa, mucosa flap, which I harvested from the lateral wall over the lacrimal uh, sac region. And then I, I rolled it over the remnant middle turbinate so this will never ever stenose. That is the idea of this whole surgery. Okay? Right. So I'm through with the surgery. <coughs> any doubts, any questions? Would you like to see the other side or would you like to just uh, say stop? Do you have time or not? Um, we, we would have some time more if we can start and see the other side. I think that the, the audience is very attracted and uh, and is enjoying the surgery. So if you have the time, we would like to stay here and watch the surgery. I have, a lot of time. <laughs> I have one more case also, no problem. Okay, see the other side. Ah, this side is a very sinister side. You can see here, elderly male presenting with a little vascularity. I always suspect something else. Could be an inverted tabuloma. Always take a biopsy. Leg oh. sleep, please. I'm just going to take that for biopsy, more vascular part of the polyp. 
the strength of biopsy. We sometimes do a frozen also. Okay, right. So having done that, so what is the step? First step of the surgery. The first step of the surgery is to humanize the airway. Where do you place the middle, uh, the deep rider? You place it on the inferior turbinate like this. And then what is the movement? Up down. One of the questions from the audience is, if you have a septal deviation and nasal polyposis, would you start by making the nasal septum surgery or you would combine first some debridement and then you move to correct the nasal septal deviation? Wonderful question, wonderful question. If you have a septal deviation on one side, that is towards the left side, maybe this is deviated towards the left side. See, whenever we do septal correction, uh, what happens is there is a lot of suction effect, it's called the Bernoulli's effect. So, better don't perform the septum completely. Finish off the side which is non-deviated. That is, if it's the right side, finish off the right side completely. That, because this side you don't have the deviation, you can complete it uh, fully. And then what you do is you create, uh, uh, you do the septal correction this side. And then what you do, you place the septum inside so that you don't have the suction, suction effect. <clears throat> and then you operate. So finish one side, which is non-deviated, then septum, then go to the other side. I hope I answered your question, my dear friend. Yes. Now I told you I'm going to do the pre-dance technique in this case. Did I tell you? Yes, for would you please remark the effect and how the vegan technique differs from a normal technique, which is the anterior to posterior, just to let the audience know what's the meaning of a vegan technique. Start from anterior, you preserve the middle turbinate, you go along the so they are called that's called the lamella technique. The first lamella is the ancillate lamella, the second is the gular lamella. Third is the basal lamella, fourth is the uh, basal lamella of the superior turbinate, and then fifth is the lam uh, lamella of the sphenoid china. So that is called the misoclingers technique. So we go from anterior to posterior, delineating the lamina papilla. Well, in cases, <coughs> so in a vegan technique, what you do is you resect the middle turbinate first. Why? Why is the vegan technique a little superior? For youngsters, the, the dreaded complication is the skull base injury. The skull base is the lowest in, at the level of the planum. So, what you do is go straight, get the planum first, and then come anteriorly. So, Vigan was very wise in, uh, you know, forming his technique because he wanted to avoid the complication, the most dreaded complication, which is the skull base injury and the anterior small artery injury. So here, already it has been resected. The middle of it has been resected. So I can take the liberty of doing a vegan speaking. See that? Now I got the sphenoid sinus. Can you all see the sphenoid sinus here? Yes. And in regards to this, I, I, uh, there's also one question. Uh, our colleague is asking, is it the floor of the sphenoid sinus at the level of the um, highest portion of the maxillary sinus? If you draw a line from the ethmo maxillary crest, give me a, a ball throw. Nice question again. If you draw a line from the ethmo, this is the ethmo maxillary crest here. So that's the upper border of the maxilla. So if you draw a line, then you will find the sphenoid os here, right here. So that's a beautiful landmark in the misoclinical technique. But in the Vigan's technique, we follow what is called the 1.2 centimeter above the coena technique. That is, that is three suction tips. You see here, that four millimeters the deep right up. One, two, and three. If you have that, you will go into the sphenoid sinus. So in the vegan, you follow it from the coena. But in the mesoclinga, you can have the maxilla as a good line. That's the Onodi cell which we saw. Very nicely seen there. Very beautiful. 
So here, change, change to the uh, forward mode, please. Forward mode. See here now. Now you can start the other case. Shift the other case and start the other case. You see. First dissipate and then. I think I will get this through in another 10 14 minutes. Uh, change. Did you see how I widened the uh, ridge there, all of you? Always try to open the sphenoid sinus wide. So that's the planum. I got the skull base now. So this is the this is the Vigan's technique which I'm following. Coming from posterior to anterior. So I wanted to show two different techniques to you. That's why I'm doing it. Of course, I can do the mesoplanar technique on both sides. But I just wanted to show you the two techniques. That's why. Uh, that is the reaction. I think it's more likely to stop there uh, and come from anterior. Always you stop there and come. See, that's a cell which we read on the CT scan. That's the skull base. You see that? How beautifully the skull base is delineated. Dr. Puya, can you see that? Yes. My dear friend, am I audible? Is the picture clear? Everything is fine. Everything is perfect. Okay. Now, having done that, now I've opened up the sphenoid, I opened up the post mod, I opened up the post mod skull base. Now I'm just going to give a wash and I'm going to do the frontal recess and the anterior frontal artery. Mm -hmm. I always do that last. Some people use the bulla up technique like Professor Seti does that very often. I'm not a great fan of that. I uh, generally don't uh, do that. I do the bullet down technique. Stamberger, Professor Stamberger used to follow the bullet down technique. So I uh, do the bullet down technique rather than the bullet up technique. Now here we are. It's a little confusing. Where's the middle terminate? All this stuff. So what I'm going to do right now. Uh, now give me the divider. So I'm going to first find out where this olfactory cleft is. Because olfactory cleft is filled with polyps. This is olfactory cleft. Can you all appreciate the olfactory cleft being opened up? My dear friend? Yes. Yes. And, and in fact, there's a question over here. And uh, our colleagues is saying, uh, wouldn't that dam damage uh, some of the olfactory fibers or might cause any CSF leakage? No way, CSF. Number one. Number two is olfactory fibers. I understand, but the thing is, if you cover it with polyp and leave it there, how will the patient have olf olfaction? Already it's gone. Patient is having <coughs> anosmia. <coughs> The only way to get back the smell is to get all those polyps off. Skull, uh, the, the CLF leak will never happen unless you are very harsh to the olfactory cleft. You see here. See how beautiful we have delineated the olfactory cleft. So beautiful. You, you retain the buccosa also there. That's very important, my dear friends. Give me a pack. Retain. Now, here, the middle tongue has been chopped off. Completely chopped off. And you know what is called the frontal sinus escape procedure. So this is what is called, I'm going to do, I'm going to show you what is called the front finest escape procedure. So we do very often such cases. Uh, we have done seventh revision, eighth revision, and all of that without navigation, you know, it is uh, very common in uh, a place like uh, our country where we have a lot of, you know, population and they they don't come for post opera to follow up very easily. So then the patient gets recurrence. Recurrence is not only because of uh, 
inadequate surgery, it is also because of in a good inadequate follow up. And sometimes the patients are lost to follow up. And they will come back with a huge recurrence. Good irrigation. Now the challenge is the front recess. How am I going to open up the front recess? Okay, right. Now, give me a knife. So, this is what is called the frontal sinus escape procedure, which I'm going to demonstrate now. So, what is the frontal sinus escape procedure? <coughs> what are the indications for it? Indication is very simple. If you have resected the middle turbinate, what happens is that the middle turbinate lateralizes and closes the front recess. So, what you have to do is to now not only open up the front recess, but also you have to uh, mucosize it. How do you do that? Again, we take a flap. So here we are, I'm going to take this flap here. Our colleagues is asking, what are the pressure uh, values of these patient is what are the highest the diastolic and systolic pressure? Now we are maintaining it at 170, but more importantly, the pulse rate is 58. I am more worried about the pulse rate rather than the blood pressure, my dear friend. If you have a good pul uh, bl uh, pulse rate, good pulse rate, then I'm telling you, then the blood pressure becomes a little secondary to it. So the best is to maintain it between 60 and uh, 65. So that is very, very important. <clears throat> this uh, instrument is specially designed by me. It's uh, neither a Frias elevator nor a knife. So I use it both as a knife as well as, as an elevator. It's a very special instrument. We, we have designed it in India and uh, it's available. Uh, give me a small scissors. So you see what I'm trying to do is to get that flap out. The, the idea is not to open the frontal. Anybody can open the frontal. That's not a big issue. But how do we maintain that frontal sinus opening? That's the bigger issue, my dear friends. So long-term post-operative maintenance of this opening is going to be the real challenge in such cases. And for that, the only way is to do the escape procedure. Now, having done that now, now give me the punch, give me the punch. Give me a suction. Now you see here, so the remnant middle turbinate, what I did was I just elevated it and I had this as a flap here. Now I have this uh, opening here, give me a uh, punch. I'm now going to punch that ascending process of maxilla like what I did that side. <clears throat> and I knew that that was a little bit of the unfinished process as well, left behind by the previous surgeon. A common mistake done by many beginners, you know, when they start, they leave behind the cell near the front recess. So your suggestion is always perform an axillary flap or not? No, no, axillary flap, not in all cases. You don't need to do it in all cases. You need to do it only when it's necessary. For example, this is a special indication for an axillary flap. It's something like an escape procedure. You have to do it or else you will not get uh, post-operative scissors. You will not get that. You cannot maintain that post-operative. I hope you understand. It is not for all cases you do the actual flap. That's the remnant. See, what has happened is the middle turbinate has lateralized here. So we have to both, uh, you know, medialize it as well as we have to mucosalize it. So that's the challenge which we are facing here. That's the nasal acrimal duct here. Can you see here? I'm pressing the nasal acrimal duct from outside. Can you see here? Yes or no? 
Yes. That is actually the lacrimal sac. So, okay, I'm trying to, it's a very new osteogenetic bone. Okay, give me now the rat 60 divided plate. Now I'm going inside. Now I know I'm going to go inside. I have that good space for me to open up the frontal. Very, very fast I will do that. It's not at all a... Opening up the frontal is nothing. Nothing. But maintenance of that opening is everything. See, another important point about the debrider is that when you're revolving at a at a speed of 7500 which is the m5 then it eats less you should understand that it eats less the faster it rotates the lesser it eats this is the basics about the divider so I, what i'm trying to do now is i'm moving it at 1000 rpm which is actually very very slow uh, yeah yeah i'm sorry just a question from the audience. Uh, the, they are asking if you're using angled powered instruments or if it's a zero degree uh, debrider. This is a 60 debrider blade, but I'm using a zero degree telescope. Perfect, thank you. Now give me a 70 degree telescope. So a quick reminder, if if the disposition, if the position of the anterior ignore artery was posterior to anterior, this time we are going to see exactly the same, but the but in this time it, it will go from the lamina papyracea and the right and in the left to the nasal septum anteriorly. Is it correct? Correct. A lot of thick bone, you know. Okay. Give me a take it. Take it at least. <coughs> now you can see that that is a very thick bone between the frontal and the fovea here. Which, yeah, I took it out. Ah, give me a anteroposterior giraffe. Anteroposterior giraffe, please. So that's the phobia, that's the frontal. I know exactly the position according to the scan. I read it nicely. And I'm going to take off just that bone alone without trying to strip that mucosa. This is a uh, giraffe is as old as me. Oh. So you see the pus coming out of the front, oh, please. Did you see that? Yes. Yes. So how do you think this guy is going to be all right? He cannot be all right because the middle is an anatomical problem. It is uh, uh, completely occluded. The frontal. How will he be all right? He will not be all right at all. Uh, give me a good wash. Give me a rat. See, whenever you have a lot of polypartial tissue which is blocking the frontal uh, sinus and the recess, 
Oh, okay, okay. Be careful, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you see the front now, all of you, please? Yes. yes. Beautiful. Now that's the frontal for sure. So how do you make it out? The frontal butt. You know what the frontal butt? The posterior wall of the frontal sinus resembles a butt. That is the convexity. The convexity. That is very, very important. Any cell will be concave. Whereas the frontal sinus, the posterior wall will be convex. This is very, very, very important, my dear friends. Now, what I'm trying to do now, so that's the frontal butt, I know that. Now, what I'm going to do is to delineate the anterior frontal artery because I have to see the boundaries of the frontal recess. So the boundaries of the frontal recess start anteriorly from the nasal frontal peak. That's the nasal frontal peak here. Here, till the level of the anterior small artery, which is here. Right? Now, that's the anterior small artery. I know that's the anterior small artery. Now, I'll try to uh, delineate it for you very clearly. Give me a. Give me a. Ball pro, please. That's the phobia. Frontal. That's the anterior small artery. This is again the posterior phobia. This is the planum which has already been delineated. Now, give me, I'm going to delineate the anterior small artery for you. Give me a pack first. Let me. Uh, I might uh, strip a little mucosa just for demonstration. Of course, you don't, uh, you can't demonstrate unless you are stripping a little bit of mucosa. So, this is the anterior small artery. Very nicely seen. I can, I can feel it beautifully. I can, in fact, feel it. Fill it with the whole flow. Give me a pack, small pack. So once I demonstrate the anterior small artery, then that's it. We have we have opened up the front very beautifully. Uh, give me the uh, jacurate, please. Jacurate. So use a lot. The, the carry home message is don't infiltrate. Don't infiltrate. People actually fanatically infiltrate. With adrenaline and uh, you know xylocaine and cocaine and so many, 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 many things. I don't like that at all. You don't need to do anything. You will get a beautiful feel if your anesthetist is good. Now I'm just going to press that behind and I'm just going to define the frontal recess for you. That's the frontal. I'm now trying to press it behind. Oh, can you give me the uh, black sleeve after? Now I'm going to give you, give you, give you, give you. I just want to take this out. Small, yeah. No, uh. Now I'm just going to show you the anterior small library. Which is exactly here. Uh, now give me the suction. Want to find a suction, please? See, you can see that beautifully here. This is not from the final suction. Can you see the uh, anterior small artery here, please? That's the anterior small artery going yes. from the here towards the middle top right. Can you see the obliquity of that anterior small artery, please? That's the obliquity. Yes. Uh, beautifully seen. You see the front recess now is very wide. You can see from here till here, here till here. Oh, beautiful. It's completely wide. No way it's going to stenose. Only thing is we have to mucosalize it. How are we going to mucosalize it is the question now. So the last look at the maxillary sinus, which I didn't look at before. Ah, uh, the maxillary sinus, I'm not as done. Uh, that's it's pretty bad, right? So after that, I will be straight away going in for the last step, namely the frontal. Now let us see this. That's the maxillary sinus.
Yeah, that's good irrigation. Thank you. They're laying the lamina up here with a layer of mucosa all the way. Beautiful. Now you can see that I'm going to do a wash in the maxi sinus. That's enough. Not going to create a raw area everywhere. Try not to create raw areas. That's very important because stenosis rate is very high when you create raw area. Give me a zero degree. So to conclude the surgery, which has taken around 50 minutes, exactly 50 minutes. Am I right? So it's not 50 minutes. One hour and 50 minutes. Uh, what is the time I started, my dear friend? Operating. Operating. Yes. Operating. We start. We started the operation at fifteen eighteen. What? Uh, of course, it is an Italian. Uh, yeah, yeah, Italian. but uh, I mean, it's one hour, right? One hour. Almost one hour, exactly. Okay, now you see what I'm doing. That's called the frontal sinus escape procedure. Very important, my dear friend. If you don't do this. I'm telling you, you're going to land up in stenosis again. See that? Can you see that the front is here? Here? Yes. The, from here to here is the frontal, and this is not going to go laterally because you have completely covered it with mucosa. The best way to prevent stenosis is mucosalize the whole thing. This will automatically little get fibrosis, but that's okay. But I don't want this to get this to get lateralized. If this gets lateralized again, you're going to land up in frontal sinus complete stenosis. Now give me a suction now. Now, give me surgery step. You have surgery step. You have surgery step. Can you see the cavity? How beautiful it looks. Smooth cavity lined with mucosa. Anatomy clearly seen. No, give me surgery step. Now, you can see here also, this side also. When you look at it, you should be able to see the phenoid sinus. See how beautiful it looks here. Again, the mucosa have lined that. Any doubts so far, my dear friend? Everything is fine. Everything is fine. People recepting it and giving compliments. We have some friends also connected. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> Dimitri Pilpiuk, uh, which was, I think, a short period of time with you to uh, learn and he is giving props also. No. Should we begin to start? No. Our colleagues is asking what or which material are you using now for packaging or for packing the cavity? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm here with you, my dear friends. We will be using nasal 4, uh, absorbable um, nasal 4, along with surgery cell for packing. And uh, that will complete the surgery. Um, uh, yeah. Perfect. So I've left some questions. Beautiful demonstration, just for a recap. I would like to stress once again that this live surgery is available in our website and YouTube and all the social media platforms for a, a recollect the procedures. We started from the right side, started with the um, opening, the 
maxillary sinuses, clearing the maxillary antrum. Then we went to the ethmoid. After that, we found out the sphenoid sinuses. Then we proceeded to open up one cell as you uh, previously cited. This has been named from our colleagues, uh, Islam Herzala. Would you please tell once again, what is the type of this cell? What are the, the description of these cells? Yeah, so we have uh, various names for so many cells, like for example, the Haller cell, which is the in, um, supramaxillary infraethmoid cell, which is the Haller. Haller can be anterior, middle or posterior. We have the Onodi cell, which is the posterior mouth cell, which is supralateral to the uh, sphenoid sinus. Now, there is a cell which has been described by my colleague, our colleague, a very nice friend of ours, uh, Professor Harzella. And that is a cell between the posterior part of the maxillary sinus and the sphenoid sinus. And that goes, it's infra ethmoid, so, um, posterior to the maxilla, anterior to the sphenoid. So, that's a very, very nice uh, definition of that cell. And uh, many of us, we fail to clear that. So this uh, patient had a beautiful cell and uh, as, as I uh, could uh, show it and uh, we, we cleared that cell and uh, yeah, you carry on. And then we move uh, anteriorly by approaching the frontal sinuses through uh, um, an approach which has been described as you say by PJ Wormald and it is a axillary approach through the, the frontal sinuses. In that way, what you have done was uh, creating a flap that was actually after that used to stabilize the middle turbinate that previously was lateralized. That access through the frontal sinuses then was carried on by inflating and nasal and, and douches inside of the frontal sinuses to clear the whole polyps. And then you demonstrated how is the course of the anterior ethmoidal artery in, in by, the, by means of a 70 degree telescope and then posteriorly to anteriorly showing up all the sinuses, the sphenoid sinuses, the posterior ethmoid, the anterior ethmoid, the anterior ethmoidal artery, the fovea, and then the frontal sinuses. Then you moved to the opposite side, to the spin, to the left sinuses, and then in this uh, this way, then you demonstrated how the superior portion of the maxillary sinus can can be uh, addressing the lower portion or the the bottom of the sphenoid sinuses by by means of uh, of a line, and that will dictate you how to reach safely by a posterior to anterior approach, which was a vegan technique, by means of opening up the sphenoid sinuses, then ethmoids, and then moving on by creating once again an axillary flap through the, the frontal sinuses. But this time, the opening was much bigger because you, in fact, was afraid of possible lateralization of the middle turbinate. And in this way, that will leave a patent osteum. Then you move to the maxillary sinuses. Perfect. One important tip that uh, Dr. John Akiram said is please do avoid injection and prefer the usage of, of cotinoids or packing the nose with a solution made by one to 500,000 of, uh, of uh, adrenaline. And that will prevent one thing specifically, which is an increase in heart rate and also for the blood pressure. And, and as you said, he, Dr. John Karam prefers uh, to have a, a, a specific blood heart rate instead of a blood pressure. Is it correct? Correct, correct. I fully agree. Uh, we have the mean uh, blood pressure around 90, but I am more, uh, more specific about the heart rate, which is, should be around uh, 60. Uh, if your heart rate is more and the BP is low, there's no point there because uh, it's going to bleed. So it's always better to have the heart rate which is controlled and that can be done with uh, uh, alpha uh, beta blockers, beta blockers, uh, selective blockers and things like that, osmolol or, um, you know, I give also preoperative adenolol 
uh, one day before 25 milligrams uh, in the night and also 25 milligrams on the day provided the patient is not an asthmatic and of course we use a lot of uh, cardio selective uh, beta blockers for reducing the heart rate heart rate to me is the key those tips were i think uh, the reply of the of the of this next question which was exactly what drugs are you using or prescribing another important thing as previously uh, addressed by dr janaki ram was how to use the tip of the debrider and and how to avoid injury both in the middle turbinate and to the nasal septum but also the techniques that he used was actually shifting between a normal debridement and the use of a potential drilling of the of the of the debrider of the shaver and that what's the what's the, the meaning of this so what's the benefit of using this technique as a as a shaver by a drilling technique yeah very very good question actually you see uh usually in revision cases or for example chronic cases of rhinosinusitis the usually the partitions the ethmoidal partitions the cell partitions will be very thin so the debrider can eat away all these partitions but in revision cases or in very maybe neoosteogenesis a little bit more thicker septum uh, the septae it doesn't it doesn't bite the uh, the 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 inter ethmoidal septae and for that we cannot use punches i don't like to use punches because when i use the punch and i pull i pull along with the mucosa of that uh, wall so generally i avoid punches because it's a traumatic instrument in the nose so i use the debrider as a forward cutting not as a drill but a forward cutting mode a drill is different a drill what it does it smashes the mucosa whereas the debrider forward mode does not traumatize the mucosa it just takes off the bone alone and the mucosa is spared so that's a beautiful technique instead of using punches i have seen a lot of people using punches they will punch and pull the mucosa comes out so the very very basic principle of mucosal sparing is gone there so that is why i always say the more mucosa you preserve the better will be the healing you cannot expose raw bone and expect a good result perfect thank you thank you jay for for all this beautiful information and the beautiful uh, surgery that you perform unfortunately we don't have much time to to see and watch the second surgery but i do think that we can schedule up for the next semester another live surgery and then we can carry on in this my brother any time for you i know so for those who who are not aware um dr janaki ram is uh, one of the in, the most uh, um i think very renowned um surgeon that really address the simplicity of his procedures by by staying essential and uh and i really would like to stress once again that the importance of our surgery as he stated at the end initially is that surgery alone is not the answer or the solution what we should provide to the patients is a complete uh, window of uh, techniques and possibilities which are not only surgery but also post operative care and this was also addressed by him during surgery by saying the possibility or the chances of risk stenosis will be higher if we leave bone exposed so please all the juniors or our t- or our rhinologists uh, watch again this uh, this um, live surgery event by dr janaki ram and if you're interested please go forward his web pages and uh, youtube pages and facebook pages you will see beautiful cases done and uh, and uh, look out for his uh, atlas i i've been uh, i've been blessed to participate in uh, in a chapter of his book and uh, and the chapter was in an atlas i can interrupt you uh, dr puya dr puya and my, our uh, team are working together for a paper on mucor mycosis and i really thank dr puya because you know that's going to be a game changing book on mucormycosis 
Dr. Puya is playing a very important role in that uh, rhinocerebral mucor mycosis. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Puya. Really, really, really. God bless. Thank you for. Thank you, and and for those who don't know, mucor mycosis uh, increased in number during COVID-19 pandemic, especially during the second wave, uh, and we saw a higher number or a huge amount of cases, especially in India. And in regards to this, if you want, we previously had a live ground rounds. I will suggest everyone to go look at that too. So you will master, you will have a lot of information on how to address your surgical um, equip because it's not just one man band show and how to address those pathologies because those are very, very aggressive. And once you have to take care of those patients, uh, the only chances for avoid recurrence is to stay aggressive because this is an aggressive pathology. Thank you, Jay, for being with us. And I really hope to see you and have you as a guest once again next season. Thank you so much, Dr. Puya. It's always a honor and pleasure. Loads of Salud. hugs. Bye-bye.